this uh, parallel session on uh, rehabilitation and the uh, return uh, to work. So welcome to everybody to this session. I, I really appreciate your uh, great effort uh, to be here after, uh, after last night's uh, enjoyment. I see that you are, uh, I mean, you look uh, refreshed. Uh, yesterday afternoon session was already uh, quite intense, but then uh, we had the chance uh, to, um, uh, to, to refresh our mind uh, with uh, some uh, good drinks, uh, good food, uh, and the dancing. So, so now here we are, ready to work. Um, the, first of all, let's try the interpretation, if any of, of you uh, needs it. There is interpretation in this room uh, from English into Spanish and German. The speakers will all be using, speaking in English, but in case uh, there, will be some quest there might be questions uh, from the audience uh, with a microphone uh, in uh, either in German or Spanish, or if you cannot understand English, you can test now the, the, the interpretation tool. Did you find the channel for the interpretation? So, okay. Then, uh, of course, uh, the usual uh, recommendation to uh, turn your mobile phone uh, quiet. You will be using Slido, so please don't turn it off just uh, to silence. And actually, keep it uh, on hold, keep your mobile phone on hold so that uh, you can, you're ready to use it uh, in a few minutes. Okay, so in this uh, session, we will uh, be addressing uh, a few challenges. First of all, to highlight the cost to society, employers and workers of failure to get people back to work. Then, to achieve a joint up policy approach to rehabilitation and return to work. And then to establish a sickness substance analysis and return to work procedures. So uh, at the end of the presentations and at the end of the discussions, I hope we will have, I mean, we will have some uh, uh, good uh, uh, key messages uh, to bring back home. This uh, session is uh, structured with uh, a, an opening uh, presentation on the why we need to take action on rehabilitation and return to work. Then uh, we will have uh, uh, three good practices uh, that uh, have been implemented in Austria, Norway and Sweden. And uh, those presentations uh, will address what can be done to facilitate rehabilitation and return to work, what was achieved in those uh, practices that have already been uh, implemented, which were the success factors, but of course uh, we're also interested uh, to hear which were the challenges that uh, they faced in implementing uh, uh, those practices. And then uh, how these uh, success stories can be transferred uh, to other countries uh, uh, in the European Union. Then we will have uh, a, 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 a voting session, so to uh, warm up the audience and uh, make sure that uh, you, uh, you are tuned on uh, the discussion uh, uh, part uh, of, the, uh, of, this, of this session. And then uh, we will have uh, questions and answers. Uh, we will have uh, an interesting uh, debate on, uh, on how we can implement uh, rehabilitation in return to works in our countries. So now you can test the Slido. We start with testing the Slido. So please uh, get your mobile phones uh, at hand. Maybe because he sees mine. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. 
So given the amount of time you spend at work, how do you think work affects your health? Huh, that's interesting. <laughs> Uh -huh. So we will have, I mean, we will have an interesting discussion as uh, we, we move on. So the majority is uh, saying that uh, work is affecting us negatively. We will have some answers uh, during our session to this, and hopefully we will change your perspective. Okay, so did it work for all of you, or uh, most of you? Yeah? Still voting? <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> So the majority has voted, uh, yeah. so yeah, so that's uh, it's an interesting um, it's an interesting view from your side. But uh, I mean, it, it, towards uh, the I mean, through the the, the session, you will uh, find out more on how work can uh, how on how your health can benefit from uh, from work. <laughs> Okay, so now we go into the content of this uh, session with the first uh, presentation. So the first uh, speaker is uh, uh, Viking Husberg, who's uh, a ministerial advisor to Ministry of Social Affairs and Health in Finland. And he will introduce us to the why. It's important. Uh, for putting my name there so that they remember who I am. <laughs> so good morning, everybody. I, I hope you had your coffee so that you will be able to stay awake for the session. <coughs> if no. you get the techniques working. This is one system. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I'm coming from the Ministry of Social Affairs and Health in Finland. And um, I think the easy and clear answer to why is, of course, that uh, good health, good working conditions, safety and health at work is a basic human right. That is the starting point. We don't need any much any more uh, reasons for that. But unfortunately, we are living in a society where money counts. And that we noticed already some 20 years ago in Finland, where we started to calculate the cost of poor working conditions. Uh, that we did at our own ministry and came to quite high numbers. However, uh, when we did it on our own, without uh, involving the social partners, there was a lot of discussions and disputes about our numbers. So we decided that we will do that uh, once more. Let me see now. I, the computer doesn't follow me, so I have to follow there. So uh, we decided that we redo this exercise in such a way that we talk with the social partners, uh, have their expert participating with us, and we do the calculation in such a way that it's conservative, that we don't overestimate anything. So all the numbers that we are using are uh, lower than we believe in, in uh, the real situation. 
Uh, this took roughly like uh, a year to go through that, and then we presented it uh, for, for uh, a broader audience. And I think that was uh, quite a good uh, conclusion, because we got quite a lot of press from it, and uh, the discussion is now continuing on how much does poor working conditions in general cost, and uh, what should we do to be able to cut 10% of these costs. So I'll give you just one example of um, the, the procedure. Uh, when we started from uh, looking at the absence due to sickness, uh, we had to divide between uh, short uh, uh, sick leaves and longer sick leaves. I won't go into all the details in the calculations, I just try to summarize them there so that we have different uh, levels for, for the shorter ones and, and uh, then we calculated 150 euro per day for longer sick leaves. Uh, the total cost for Finland is 3.4 billion euros in a year. And when we divide that to an employee, you can see that it's about 1,600 euros uh, per employee and per day. But that is just one part. We had a look then at uh, also people working while they are sick at work. And all the research saying that this cost is as, at least as high as uh, for the sick leaves. Uh, we uh, again used uh, the lower value and uh, calculated with 3.4 billion for that. Uh, then we had a look at occupational accidents and diseases. Uh, there we calculated the direct costs, added about three to four times indirect costs, which is based on the research that we have done with figures coming from individual enterprises where they assess both the visible cost and the indirect costs. And if I may say here, that is a problem for the enterprises to actually find the direct costs. If it would be possible to change their budgeting so that they would be able to see the direct cost of an accident, then they definitely would do much more to get rid of accidents and diseases. But when it's hidden in the budget, and especially the indirect costs are hidden somewhere, then they need to do quite a lot of work to actually find these costs. Uh, then we had a look at disability pensions. And uh, if you calculate how many people in a year are going on disability pensions uh, due to bad working conditions, you can see that eight billions in a year. If you then would multiply that with the number of years that they are continuing continuously on disability, then the number is growing. We also had a look at the cost of health care. We took away the preventive cost uh, because that's an investment. And we came to 24 billion euros in a year. So, uh, the Finnish government is struggling with the budget. They need to save 4 billion euros from the budget. If we are able to cut down on these costs with 10%, we do quite a lot already. And that investment to, do, to cut down on the 10% is not tremendous. Uh, we have a lot of research in the world showing that uh, the, the return on investment is uh, approximately two times of uh, the input. So that is the money thing. When we look at uh, what it looks like in Finland about people, we are not talking about disability, we are talking about people who have a partial work ability. We are looking at the positive thing, what is left for the people that they still can use in the work life. Then the estimate is that uh, 1.9 million of people have some type of, some type of a disability or a chronic disease. Uh, 
600,000 things that this uh, impacts their uh, work opportunities. And too often people with disabilities, uh, with a partial uh, work ability, are not able to get uh, uh, a job. So that's a problem and uh, we have started up a, a governmental project to look at how can we make more effective the system, the various systems that are existing to help uh, partially workable uh, workability, people with partial workability to go back to work. And we noticed that there are so many systems that it's difficult to, to be able to deal with them all. And then uh, the idea was to set up a person who can help the enterprises and the disabled people uh, to find jobs. And uh, that uh, project has been working now in addition to a number of other projects. And uh, the results are quite nice. Uh, the number of disability pensions are going down. Uh, but uh, there's of course, as you see, still quite a lot of things to do. So if this is enough to explain why we need to do something, I think we need to go back and, and remind ourselves of that it's not the money issue. It's a basic human right that we are talking about. Thank you. So thank you, Viking. I mean, I, I believe uh, this presentation uh, is uh, quite uh, provoking. Uh, also considering that, uh, now I don't know exactly how many people live in Finland, uh, but five and a half uh, million people live in Finland. So it's, uh, a, I'd say, a small country compared uh, to some other countries in Europe. So if uh, we consider that uh, those are the costs uh, of uh, uh, partial workability or uh, disability to the, to the country, can you imagine uh, the, the costs, uh, how the costs uh, would uh, multiplicate in, other can in larger countries like Italy or uh, uh, Germany, France? or UK, so it is a, a so it's, it's a issue, it's a, it's a problem that we need to address, both for a human rights, for, for, for a human rights perspective, but also because of the uh, incredible costs on the society and the government. So now the next uh, speaker is uh, Trude Eliassen, uh, uh, who will uh, present us uh, a good practice in Nor Norway. Uh, Trude is a senior advisor at the Norwegian Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs, and uh, she's working on uh, several tasks. One of her major tasks uh, is uh, on uh, um, uh, working on uh, uh, reducing youth unemployment uh, in Norway. So Trude, please. Um, I would start by thanking for uh, this invitation. Uh, it's an uh, honor to be here uh, in this important summit. Um, as my colleague from Finland just said, it has serious consequences for the human being uh, and for the society if we don't manage to get young people in work, middle-aged people to stay in work, and old-aged people to continue. <clears throat> What I would like to talk about today is what the Norwegian government do to facilitate employment for young people, aiming at enabling them to have a lifelong work career. It doesn't quite work here. I think I need some... Uh, <laughs> it's not the same slice that is here. Ah. There we are. That's it. Okay, thank you. So I should use this. Okay, yeah. Uh, as 
you can see from this slide, um, this is some key figures about Norway. I will not give you the number, you can read them. But what is shortly says is that Norway is a scarcely populated country like Finland. I think uh, we are even fewer. <laughs> Uh, we have a high life expectancy, well-functioning economy with high production and high wealth creation. We have a well-functioning labor market with high employment rate, both, by both the, uh, in female group and among seniors. And we have uh, a low unemployment rate, both in the total population and among youth, even though it's quite high, we think. Uh, this is the figure from 2016, and it has uh, been improved since then, and it's still improving. We also have a good welfare system, uh, with univer which is universal and state-financed. We have a high education level, uh, with um, relatively few youth not in employment, education or training. So, uh, as you can see, and hear from what I say, Norway is quite a good country to live in. But we also have challenges. We have quite a high amount of people outside the labor force on health-related benefit. That is both because uh, we have a rich, quite rich benefit system, um, which is good, <laughs> but also a challenge. Uh, I will shortly give you some um, uh, an overview of some structural features characterizing the labor market, which both provide opportunities for uh, us, but also is making challenges. Uh, as for the rest of the society, we have a globalized labor market, increased economy, increased competition, competence requirements, and we have uh, requirements and demands and rooms for flexibility, which both give opportunities for the in single worker, but also uh, create some challenges for those vulnerable groups. Job seekers and workers with less experience, low qualification, reduced work capacity, health problems, those who temporarily or permanently need adaption of the workplace are at risk. Um, then I will give you a short skiss of the Norwegian labor market policy. We have an active and mainstream labor market policy, which means that we uh, are using uh, quite a large amount on uh, labor market measure to improve the workability of those vulnerable groups. We are focusing on labor market schemes uh, in uh, the ordinary labor market, like follow-up schemes uh, and uh, measures that should support the businesses in the ordinary uh, workplace. Uh, we have a differentiated uh, public employment service, which is uh, providing self-service uh, uh, solution for most job seekers, but which focus on early intervention and uh, tailored follow-up for vulnerable groups. And we have several initiatives targeted at youth, as they are one of our most prioritized group. Young people, immigrants uh, from outside EU and long-term unemployed are prioritized, as those are those who are most challenged at the moment in the labor market. Uh, we have also uh, strengthened the activity and mobility uh, requirements, uh, the practice of it in our um, benefit schemes. And uh, we cooperate very closely with the social partners and businesses. Uh, I will shortly tell you something uh, about uh, our special uh, programs targeted at youth. First, in 2012, we, uh, the government launched the job strategy for people with disabilities. 
the main strategy is uh, focus, uh, focus on strengthening labor, measures, ma ma labor market measures in the ordinary labor market. Uh, uh, we also uh, strengthen follow-up and adjustment schemes. It has been strengthened several times since it was launched in 2012. The main target group is disabled with reduced workability under the age of 30. And the main objective is employment in the ordinary labour market. Uh, then this year uh, the government launched a new uh, and important uh, youth initiative which replaces three previous youth guarantees, which is kind of a break with what is happening elsewhere in Europe, where uh, youth guarantees has been promoted as quite important. But for us, we found that they didn't work very well, so we have changed. So now we have made a more targeted and powerful nationwide uh, youth initiative, which is a systematic strengthening of the public employment services targeting young people. The target group are all youth not in employment, education or other appropriate activities eight weeks after being registered by the PES as job seekers, also public employment services. Uh, either they are unemployed or they have reduced work ability and which are under the age of 30. So we reach quite wide when we set the aid limit at 30. Uh, the content of the uh, initiative is that to ensure that the youth uh, within eight weeks quickly should be ensured a planned and individually tailored work-oriented follow-up by the public employment services. That is to make sure that no youth are going without activities, being decre uh, having decreased their motivation and their skills. The objective is to promote fulfilling of education, uh, enable them to participate in job search, work uh, or other appropriate work-oriented activity, focusing on a lifelong working career. Then I will continue to the government's uh, cooperation with the social partners. In Norway we have a very important cooperation with the social partners through the Inclusive Workplace Agreement. And I have several colleagues which are here listening and which uh, in fact know more about this than me and which can correct me if I say something wrong. Uh, this is uh, in Norway a very important agreement, which is both on national level, on regional level and on local business level. So it's quite powerful. <clears throat> uh, the objectives is to improve the working environment, to strengthen occupational safety, to preventing and reducing sickness absence, to increasing the employment of young disabled, to contract early retirement and to increase the retirement age. So quite wide aspects of including goals and quite difficult also to achieve. I will not go into depth on what we have achieved and not on this, but as I'm focusing what we do for the young one, so I will just continue. Uh, the content of this agreement, as I said, is both uh, cooperation on the national level, level with the, between the government and the social partners on all these overall goals. But it's also cooperation on the local business um, level, on concrete businesses. So when an enterprise is signing an inclusive workplace agreement, it triggers the right in form of grants and technical assistance from the public employment services, aiming at facilitating um, sick prevention leave, um, facilitating uh, employment of disabled, and to fulfill all these ob objectives which are set for the agreement. Um, in uh, 2016, beginning of 2017 this year, we had a mid-term 
uh, assessment of the agreement, which is, uh, um, yeah, I forgot to say that the first agreement was agreed upon in 2001, and then it has been uh, renegotiated several times, lastly in 2014, and now is going on to 2018, where there will be a new, new renegotiation. So then we had uh, this midway assessment in the um, beginning of this year, I would say. And after the midway assessment, we agreed upon that there should be three focus areas which we should uh, increase our focus on, cooperating together. Um, I will mention those. One, it was agreed upon to focus even more on preventive work environment issues. Two, it was agreed upon to uh, focus even more on uh, facilitating entrance to the labour market for people with reduced work ability. So we sharpened our goal of um, increased employment of disabled to disabled with reduced work ability, uh, which is uh, young people who um, have health problem which make it difficult for them to get into the labor market, quite broad still. Uh, and uh, the third uh, focus area was knowledge de development of the inclusive work, uh, workplace agreement. Um, uh, then uh, the government and the inclusive uh, and the social partners through the um, inclusive workplace agreement uh, agreed to make an EA action plan for employment of youth. Um, and um, the target group is both young people under 30 with reduced work capacity who can get ordinary work with follow up from, from the public employment services. And it's also um, inclusive workplace businesses and their employers and union representatives. So the initiative should both focus on facilitating activity for all these three partners. Uh, the content of uh, the action plan is to strengthen ongoing activities and cooperation between the social partners, enterprises and the public employment services. And uh, so we wanted to build on all the good activities that, uh, for instance, the organizations which are representing the businesses have ongoing to facilitate even more inclusion work in this area and uh, to strengthen uh, the services that PES offer to these businesses when trying to include youth. Um, and um, we also wanted to further develop knowledge on good examples of, of inclusion of vulnerable group and youth. Uh, it is the public employment services who has the responsibility for the um, overall coordination of this action plan. And, uh, it will, and it is cooperated on with the social partners to implement the initiatives. And it's a lot of different initiatives in this plan. The objective is to promote fulfilling of uh, uh, education. Uh, it is to uh, improve the employment rate and it's to improve employment with wage subsidies and other work related activities in the workplace. <coughs> uh, now I will shortly say something uh, about what I see as the main success factors when uh, aiming at facilitate inclusion of uh, vulnerable youth. I think it is necessary to provide qualification and education as those who have, uh, for those who have low skills. I think it is uh, important to emphasize uh, on the workplace as the main area for inclusion. Because uh, if it's not um, worth the money, the business will not include the youth. So we cannot hope that good thing will happen. We have to make them happen by being realistic. 
and by good dialogue and good cooperation and by listening to each other. Uh, uh, I think it's necessary to provide a labor market measure which support uh, participation in the ordinary labor market. It make it possible for the businesses to take the chance to take in vulnerable youth, to make it worth the money for them. Um, uh, in doing so, I think counseling, mentoring and ongoing support is key factors as well as training and work experience in the real working environment. I think it is important that the businesses, businesses should be sure that whenever they are willing to take in, uh, take in a vulnerable youth, they should be sure that the public employment services will support them with necessary follow-up and assistance whenever they are in need of it. Mm. Then I think then we have a good chance of succeeding. Um, and uh, we have seen that uh, one of these measures which, which we have succeeded with is uh, vague subsidies combined with closed follow-up. Early intervention and well-coordinated services is also a key issue when aiming at success. Um, and national, I think also uh, it's necessary, like in the EI agreement, to have a national drive combined with flexibility at the local level. Close cooperation with the social partners and businesses is the all most important thing, because if you don't have businesses who want to hire and recruit vulnerable youth, then we don't have anything. Um, so it's important to establish trust and an arena for inclusion. Creating and understanding uh, a common uh, objectives among businesses, employers and a public authority is vital. What about the transferability? My aim has been to share and gain knowledge on an important and challenging policy area. Improving employment of vulnerable youth and vulnerable groups in general. I would not say that we have found the final answer. But as we still are facing challenges. But I would say that I think we do something right. I think that some of the success factors which I mentioned on the previous slides, like uh, enabling uh, businesses uh, to be willing to take the chance on vulnerable youth by providing necessary support by the public employment services and by um, fo focusing on early intervention before the youth lose their motivation and their skills. Because I think it's much more easier enabling young people to have a good start in their labor career than uh, to try to get somebody in who have been out of work for a long period. As you know, that is very, very difficult. My intention with this presentation has been to inspire you, <laughs> uh, to pick ideas uh, and uh, that would be relevant in your specific context. Uh, and to learn uh, from what we do that is good, but also from our mistakes. And finally, I would say that there is a need for more evidence-based uh, policy making. Thank you for your attention. So thank you, Trude. It was uh, quite an interesting um, presentation with uh, an interesting perspective. Uh, and of course, uh, a lot of questions already <laughs> raised into my head after uh, your presentation. So uh, the Slido is an ongoing tool that uh, you can uh, use uh, uh, constantly. So you can ask, uh, you can already ask uh, questions uh, on the first uh, two presentations uh, if you have some. So please uh, use the tool as much as you can.
so that uh, we'll collect uh, the all the, the questions uh, for the end. Okay? So now I'll uh, uh, give the floor to Karin Flick, who's a senior advisor at the National Board of Health and Welfare in Sweden, and uh, she's also a member of the National Council of Agencies uh, focusing on uh, vocational rehabilitation. So Karin, please. Please. <laughs> so, I'm just going to have my clock here. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, hi, everyone, uh, and uh, I'm very glad to be here. Unfortunately, I arrived uh, late last night, so I couldn't join you at the event, and I couldn't, e I couldn't join you at the afternoon sessions as well. I was stuck at Amsterdam Airport, unfortunately. But now I'm here and uh, it's, uh, I really enjoyed listening to my colleagues here. And uh, I'll talk about something similar but still different. Uh, but first uh, I will talk about financial coordination through coordination agencies. Um, first of all, uh, in Sweden, just just to set you on track, um, it's a bit, uh, uh, the situation is a bit similar to the situation in Norway. We have high life expectancy, a high employment rate, about 80% of the population is employed, and uh, um, it's actually uh, increasing at the moment. We're recovering from the latest recession. But uh, for the persons who are not employed, uh, of course, the employment rate on is not uh, increasing. Actually, among people with uh, disabilities, about 50% are unemployed. Uh, and we have about, um, there are about um, 300,000 people, a bit more, I think, who, who receive a disability pension in, in uh, some uh, form. So, uh, and we have uh, 9 million uh, inhabitants. The population is 9 million people. So. Um, uh, a lot of people is uh, standing outside the labor market. Uh, anyway, uh, as I said, I'm here to talk about financial coordination. It's a very concrete example. Uh, and the platform for this coordination is uh, uh, the law uh, on financial coordination, who came into force in 2003, January actually. No, um, 2004, of course. It was decided upon in 2003, so it's been uh, it's been around for a while. Uh, and the budget is um, uh, well, it's quite big. It's uh, 560 million crowns. Uh, it was uh, in uh, the, the latest numbers we have is from uh, 2015, and it's I think it's the same for. 2016 and 17 as well, and this is about um, 56 uh, million euros. Um, and uh, even though, it, uh, of course, the law is national, it's national law, but the work is done on a local level. Uh, and uh, we have 82 collaboration agencies in the country on a local and regional level. And uh, uh, the members are from, um, uh, with members from the social insurance offices, the employment, uh, labor market offices, and the municipalities, and the healthcare. Uh, so it's, um, yeah. And 247 of Swedish 290 municipalities are a member of one collaboration agency. Uh, and in 2015, uh, 33,500 people uh, took part in a, an activity uh, who was facilitated by a, a collaboration agency. And of course, if you, yeah, uh, almost 35,000 people. Uh, and uh, given that we have, yeah, 9 million inha inhabitants in Sweden, yeah, you can, it's, it's a, quite a lot large number. Uh, and the budget, the finances, it's always the tricky question. Uh, the state, the national level, finance 50% of the 
uh, budget. And the municipalities and the county councils who are responsible for healthcare, uh, they are uh, financing the other half, 20% each. So uh, you, you, you have a joined up budget here. That's one of the key issues. And this is how it looks in every collaboration agency. Every part uh, 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 financed the agency with their own uh, money. And the target groups, well, first of all, uh, the collaboration agencies have a slight, uh, slightly different focus on, uh, uh, on the target groups uh, due to lo uh, different local challenges and, and uh, circumstances and needs. But on a whole, you can say uh, uh, the target group for uh, financial coordination is uh, individuals in need of coordinated services from two or more of the organizations involved in the coordination agency. So if you are in need of say, uh, social assistance only, you're not in the target group. You have to, have, you have to need uh, support from at least two of the members. Uh, healthcare, uh, municipalities, social service, uh, social insurance offices, uh, or, or uh, labor market office. And it's, since it's very person-centered, it's difficult to, to say, uh, to say, be more specific about the persons, but it can be physical, psychiatric, social, or vocational needs. Um, it's very different. And these persons are identified locally uh, by uh, one of the members in, the organize, uh, in this collaboration agencies um, at the offices. For, for it's, it's mo mostly they are identified by, uh, when they go to the uh, social insurance office or, or the municipality social service and they, uh, they take, uh, decide upon whether these persons should take part in a... In, in a activity facilitated by a collaboration agency. Uh, and there's a limit in uh, age. Uh, the target group is uh, individuals between 16 and 64 years. So you cannot be young, uh, younger than 16 or older than 64. And what are the purpose with the um, uh, collaboration agencies? Well, it's about uh, the individual should reach or improve workability, of course, and to avoid unnecessary vicious circles or grey areas between authorities, develop well-functioning um, collaboration between author authorities, and achieve a more effective use of resources in the whole system. So it's both the purposes are both on an individual and on a, a structural level. And why? Shouldn't we be able to t handle this even without the collaboration agencies? I don't know about your countries, but in, in Sweden, um, the organization of the public welfare is done through silos, very much through silos, uh, which uh, complicates, uh, it complicates things, and especially collaborations between authorities. And sometimes individuals need solutions that demand a more comprehensive view, uh, and authorities have, uh, often have different goals and missions. And I think this is quite generic, it's not very specific for Sweden. And the responsibility for each uh, authority is sometimes muddled, and there are no economic incentives to collaborate. collaborate. And uh, often, um, if, you don't, if, you work, uh, if your work is done through silos, I believe that collaboration is often experienced as more, being more expensive uh, than not collaborate. At least in the short run, it's um, uh, what's in it for me. That's, that's the question. Um, and of course, there are administrative limits, um, different budgets and responsibilities, and different rules, regulations, and also uh, different cultures and different use of language and terminology and so on, and that often, can often cause a bit of a misunderstanding. Different values, attitudes and enthusiasm for collaboration. Not everyone is very fond of it. But, uh, so that's uh, why we really need this. Um, most of the time um, it works out quite well, but um, for some people, some people really, really need uh, a more um, collaborated, uh, the, the uh, 
collaboration agencies and this um, joined, joined up support. And um, about the collaboration agencies, they are, I'll describe the organizations a bit more now, agencies, they are their own statutory body and every agency is led by a board where every member organization is represented. And this is, this is uh, quite important, I think, that the, the board consists of all the members, member organizations. Um, and the board consists of both politicians and civil servants. And that's quite amazing, I think. Uh, and they are uh, coordinating, ma uh, they are also uh, managers uh, every agency has its own manager, coordinating a manager who facilitates the, uh, and support uh, the activity. So, so you have a board and a manager. And it's quite interesting because when you meet the board of agency, you cannot tell who's a civil servant or who's, politician, who's a politician and, and uh, who's from the municipality and, and so on. So it's uh, quite exciting. And the collaboration agencies decide how the resources are to be used, uh, joint steering and joint up budgets. So, so uh, these 560, oh, 56 million euros divided in, uh, on uh, 82 um, agencies. Um, every agency uh, board, uh, yeah, decide upon um, how to use the resources. And the point of departure are the needs of the individual and the benefits for society as a whole. So you do it together all the way, every step. The duties of the board, I can skip that one, actually, I, I, I have said that. Uh, but what about the results? We have these collaboration agencies uh, almost uh, in every municipality. In, um, widespread in the country, uh, working together around uh, individuals, uh, joined up budget and so on. So what are the results? And these are numbers from the first six months of this year. 50% of the participants uh, completed their intervention or their activity uh, in the collaboration agency. Um, half of them uh, completed it. And out of these 50%, 40% uh, of these continued to, to uh, the vocational rehabilitation. They took a step forward um, and, and uh, continued the rehabilitation. 40% went on to the labor market or to studies, to school. 30% and this is uh, out of these 50% who, com uh, who completed their uh, activities, 30% received no more financial support from uh, social assistance or disability pension. They, they support, started to support, could support themselves. Uh, really good numbers. Uh, and we, we are, uh, at the moment, we are uh, conducting a few studies and follow ups and just to make sure how. how how do they turn out in the long run? Uh, after two years, can they still support themselves or are they back in the support system? Um, but one third of the per people, uh, persons who, are, um, complete, uh, who have completed their rehabilitation or activities uh, no, no longer need help with uh, financial support and 40% went, went on to the labor market or to school and studies. And the success factors, well, we have this legal framework that's always important and it's a huge um, uh, help, uh, success factor. And the allocation of resources, a joined up budget, of course. And this comprehensive view of, on the needs of the individual. When in this, within these agencies, um, there is a comprehensive view. And the, the vocational rehabilitation and rehabilitation is very, very person-centered. It's the basic, it's the platform of it all. And competences to work and communicate uh, over professional organizational boundaries. Uh, you overcome all those problems. Mutual trust and respect and a supportive leadership, of course. And challenges, well, there are very few challenges, to be honest, but uh, collaboration agencies is still unknown in some municipalities. 
um, and uh, the difficult so, so in some parts of Sweden, the difficulties involving health care in county councils, uh, and a lot more people, a lot more individuals could benefit from the interventions. Um, as, you, as you heard, uh, only 33,000 people were, took part in, in uh, this, uh, this form of rehabilitation uh, each year. And uh, there are a few new target groups, asylum seekers and young persons under the age of 16. So uh, new target groups, uh, are, are, uh, that's, a, that's another challenge. Well, that's about it. Thank you. So thank you, Karen. That was another quite interesting presentation because one of the challenges that we often face in, uh, in our work is, uh, to, is that uh, the investment, for instance, uh, sometimes to keep uh, people at work uh, is uh, paid by the, uh, the, the health system and then the return on the investment uh, is on other services, maybe the, the welfare uh, department or the, uh, the employers. So this uh, uh, silos kind of work needs to be uh, cut down. So this is a, a good example. Of course, uh, I mean, I have also on this, uh, on this topic uh, quite a few uh, questions uh, because it look, as it was presented, it looked rather uh, easy to implement. But uh, I imagine that uh, the transferability to other countries or contexts in Europe uh, would be rather a challenge. So the next uh, uh, speaker is uh, uh, Irene Kloemüller from Austria. Uh, she's uh, leading uh, the Fit to Work uh, Business uh, Counseling uh, Program. And uh, she's a medical doctor. She's uh, teaching at the Medical University and the, at uh, the Academy of Occupational Health uh, Medicine. So Irene. Thank you. It's nice to be here. And thank you for the invitation that I can present our program here. Sorry. You're working. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Sorry. This was my is this presentation. One? Is this one? Oh, yeah. It was fine. <laughs> this bad. Mm. No. This bad. Oh, okay, now this. Thank you. So, on behalf um, of Fit to Work, I'm glad to present um, some aspects of our program. And I want to start to show you um, how it is uh, organized, the program. Actually, it's called the Return Fit to Work, Return to Work program. It's the national program of the government, of the Austrian government. And it's founded by the government in ESF money. And it's based on a law. We have a Health, Labor and Health Act, but it's not obligatory for the companies to join in, like in Germany, for example, or in other countries, it's voluntary for the people, for the companies, and also the employees to join in. But for us, it was very important that we are based on a law because uh, it um, facilitates some uh, aspects to go on. Now, at the moment, we started in 2012, 13. Uh, we have over 1,100 companies already included in the, in the program. And um, yeah, there come, we have two-thirds of companies of small and medium-sized companies. And we think this is a success because they're very hard to address, actually. Uh, to get in contact with them, to get them in the program. And when we started, we could see that um, the big companies joined in actually, and afterwards, time after time, small companies joined in, and as medium-sized companies, and they're really now uh, following us, really. Um, it's found or financed by different organizations in Austria, uh, the Public Employment Service, the uh, retirement insurance, the accident insurance, the Federal Ministry of Social Affairs and Labor, and the social uh, the health insurance, so and also of, uh, by ESF money, and um, yeah, so we, we have the um, social partners in the advisory board. They are not financing or co-financing the program, but they're in the advisory board. So what I want you to show is that we are actually trying to make a systematic approach and to show a, a red thread, how we call it, and that's what's the picture 
wants to signal, signalize, actually. So what are we doing or trying to do uh, in the company, spinning the red thread, is we are trying or we are counseling the companies to establish and implement an integration management system. For us, and we found out it's very important that they have the systematic approach. The problem was they are, were addressing people off the sick leave in different ways. Um, somebody, some companies calling the people, some other companies, you know, sending letters to the to people at different times when off sick leave. So this was a little not systematic approach. So we are saying it's very important to uh, insta and to 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 open yeah. Uh, a systematic approach and um, to offer in between the systematic approach and individual, of course, support. So usually the companies now address the people between 30 or 50 days of sick leave and we define with them how to do it is and we train the people how to do it is and we then, of course, we prepare the plans together with the companies how to reintegrate uh, people of the sick leaves um, never mind what, sick, uh, what um, of course, uh, w what the sickness was. So this, um, of course, it's a difference if you have a cancer patient or you have a um, musculoskeletal uh, disorder patient. But in between the systematic approach, we individualize the, pro the plans. So, and then the, the, the integration plans um, means uh, there are different ways how to do this. Huh? It's not only the individual support, but we are looking at the workplace and the work, to work time modules, and we're trying to uh, counsel the companies to do something there. And for us, it's very important because we are only um, allowed to counsel the companies for uh, the longest period is three years. So we are trying to build up the knowledge in the company, and we're building up reintegration teams in the company and a coordinator, kind of coordinator in the company who has the knowledge about the networking and how to do this plan. So this is one of the ideas how to, to uh, achieve a sustainable approach also. For us, we found out it was very important to raise the awareness to, you, to reduce negative stigmatism about sickness. Not only as we could see, uh, also I must say in Austria, many people think that, health, that work affects negatively health, but we have a lot of problems if you address that you have a, a disability problem or you have a, a sickness or a disorder in the company. So we had to do a lot at the beginning there to raise awareness that you could talk about it actually open-minded. And of course we lo worked a lot with the superiors in the company to support this. And um, our, I think one of our major tasks was, um, as it was shown before in the presentation, to stimulate and coordinate the network around the companies. <clears throat> because we have a lot of support facilities, but they're not so much coordinated. So one of our tasks was to, to show which networks around could support uh, the company and the employee from the social insurance, from the health insurance, from different rehabilitation programs, medical therapy, vocational training. So now the companies who are, uh, that are joining in our program, they have a good view about the network and which part of the network is important for them. And we also are advising them, we have a new reintegration part-time model, Wieder Eingliederungsteilzeit, it's based on a law, it was just uh, opened now in July this year, and we're also advising them to, to use this program to reintegrate people stepwise after they can return from sick leave. For the employees, of course, we are supporting them in-house in the, in the company. So it's an in-house integration program for the employees. We are providing them about the information and the possibilities they have of the re reintegration at the best together with the coordinator on the company level. So we're taking in the company level a coordinator together to advise and provide information. Then we are preparing together with them the reintegration plan, you always have an, a, a side uh, for the company and you also have an individual plan and you have to fit together. So we are helping to coordinate this integration process. Also again, here the employees are advised how they are getting information and about the network. For example, we found out that people are in sick leaves, were, let's say for some weeks already, and they're not having a really good medical treatment, treatment for example, because the general practitioner 
to have a psychiatric problem doesn't send them to the specialized. So we are trying to support them also to get the right information and the best treatment in time. So, and then slowly start to think how they could come back and be if you have retraining or another support, a medical support, if they're still in, in when they're again back in work process is needed. So it's a kind of um, coach on time, we could see. Um, and we're also coaching them together with the company coordinator when they're coming back. And of course, they all, we're also advising them for the reintegration part-time model because um, it actually the stimulation must come from the employee uh, to, uh, to achieve this program. So, to show you what we achieved, um, of course not all people are coming back like this. Yeah? Uh, we would say that about 70% of the people we are addressing in the companies are, are using this program. 30%, some of percent are coming back without support and some, some are not interested to participate. And we are not forcing them, we are just trying to, to advise them, to give them information. So, but we could see that once it starts and you have one successful um, uh, case in the company, then it, you know, it, uh, it's like um, people talk about this, that it worked, and then we can see uh, it continues. So what we could see is that on the individual level, it really the systematic approach and the support of, with this reintegration plan, it increases the chances for a good reintegration and stabilization of workability. Before that, we often had this uh, thing that you were on sick leave and then re you returned and you were fully back at work, but of course you had an increased workability. So it was on-off uh, or, or off-on principle. Now we have the stepwise approach and it's, um, that enhances the chance uh, really to stabilize slowly your workability and to maintain, uh, to maintain it for a long time. Um, so we could see that the drop back or the, the, the knockout uh, rate for um, returning to sick leave again, they reduced really very, on a very large scale. Um, on a company level, as I said before, we are very happy that we have a large number of small and medium sized and big companies joining the program, but they are they're really also small and medium sized programs. They are m more than even big companies. And we can see that the um, sustainable reintegration rate really was rising, or is rising. Uh, we could see, and this is um, um, calculated on, um, from the insurance, that we could see a reduction of long-term sick leaves in the companies joining the program. That's uh, slowly working out, but now after some years we can see that there is a reduction. And what we can notice, and this is, I think, very important, that it is a reduction of the boost talk about health problems and workability programs. And I think this is a very basic success to continue. Um, I put in a grayer shade, we can see a reduction of disability retirement, but there are different reasons for this, and it's working slowly, yeah? and it's only in some companies. So this, we are not really so successful until now on this uh, to achieve this, yeah? uh, but we will continue. I think it's a matter of time actually. So from the stakeholders and insurance, I, we, I think we be counseling the stakeholders from the health and uh, social insurance to use our experiences and for their offerings where they have a lot of uh, possibilities and offerings to, imp to improve the interfaces, the collaboration for example, between rehabilitation and reintegration. And we're also supporting new developments in connection with medical and vocational rehabilitation models. Uh, like in Germany, you have this um, integrated model, and now we're trying, we have three rehabilitation centers also already applying a medical and vocational uh, rehabilitation together. And we are counseling and advising them to make the interfaces also to the companies and the occupational health service. And then of course we're advising policy makers, we're trying to advise policy makers, for example, with the new law, how this could be integrated also in fit to work program. So to summarize, yeah, um, we see it is possible to return to work and stay at work. And I think it's important not only to return to work, but to stay at work. Beside, or even if you have long sick leaves, it's possible. We can show or be proved that the reintegration management works for the employees as for the employer. So it's really a win-win situation, I think. 
It's, we could show that we can maintain workability, and of course, workability also means higher productivity. We also can calculate this for the company. Sometimes the companies want it calculated. We're doing this, and we can safeguard jobs because uh, people don't lose their jobs. They can stay in jobs. They retain their jobs. And um, now we can see that many companies are using it as a kind of employer branding program too to address new employ employees uh, that they are supporting them if they have a, a medical or health problem. So I think this is also a way to use it, um, and it's, I think it's ethical okay to use it also for this. Of course, we have some challenges. Still, we have some challenges. Um, at the beginning, we could see that it sounds strange, but the companies sometimes had too little and too much information or the wrong information. So uh, we were surprised how little companies uh, had access to their network around. Yeah? Uh, bigger companies, they were, they, it, for them it was easier, but for the small and medium-sized companies, they didn't have any information. And then they had the wrong information. Yeah? And then, of course, this caused a lot of problems. So if this was one of the challenges. Um, a challenge still is the interfaces, the collaboration between the different stakeholders. We're trying to coordinate and we are really, I think, we're making good success there. We still have a big problem with the general practitioners in the interface because they're not really supporting an early return of the sick leave in Austria. I don't know how it is in your countries, but it's, a, I think, a great problem we have to address. Uh, a big challenge at the beginning was the mistrust uh, from the employees and sometimes also that companies that reintegration process can be misused for something else. So people just want to change the job and they say they are sick and that's why and they are, then they have a training and they go to another job. So, but I think this was is easily, yeah, we can argument very easily and it's, we didn't find any, actually any, any really um, mis um, misusing of this program. And uh, so this was the last point, the, the, the abusing or misusing of the program, so we couldn't find it actually, but this was in the mind at the beginning. So what can be transferred? Um, I think we can transfer the experience of building up the in-house integration model. In-house means in, on the company level, because there you have the interest of the employers and the employees and their willingness to do something and if you support them to coordinate this then you have a higher success. We can I think also transfer the knowledge of how to make it a proper or good integration plan for the individual and the occupational level side. So this can be I think transferred quite easily. I think the network around differs from country to country very much and also the social insurance, so you have to look there closely. I think this can be, can be not easily transferred from, to other countries. So this was, I think, my final mes message. Yes, and this is my colleague also who is coordinating with me the program. Yeah, and you can follow us also on a homepage or if you have some, want some other information, of course, I can supply you. Thank you. And that, well, while preparing for the poll, the speakers to come on the, so that uh, for the for the discussion and for answering the, the questions. So. so, can you come to Irina? <laughs> A bit of exercise. So now, are you ready with Slido? Take your phones at hand because we have uh, a few questions uh, for the poll. So, the, the f so are you all uh, ready with the phone <coughs> in your hands? So the, the first question is uh, what percentage of workplaces reported having in place measures to support return to work following long-term sickness absence? 57%, 67% or 77%?
Are you voting? So the, the Still voting? Yeah. Well, so the so I mean you are a bit uh, pessimistic uh, to the to the answers that we got uh, because we the, the right answer is 67 percent. But, <laughs> I mean, this is the answer that we got uh, from uh, uh, a survey, but uh, I, uh, I'm a bit skeptical with this answer. Curious, our speakers, I mean, they, they mentioned uh, the, the, um, how important it is uh, to involve uh, ent uh, uh, enterprises, companies uh, into those programs and uh, they mentioned uh, how they, uh, uh, how, to, to which extent uh, uh, employers are involved uh, in their good practices. But I'm really curious uh, to know what would be the motivation according to your experience, uh, to get uh, uh, companies on board. Because, for instance, uh, from my angle, I have a uh, really hard time to get uh, uh, employers uh, involved. I don't know if, uh, well, actually, there might be some uh, employer representatives in the room. Are there companies, employers in the room? Uh -huh. Okay, so well, let, let's hear from, the, from our experts, but then uh, maybe you may also comment on this. What, what do you think uh, are, who, Irene, you may want to say, what, what do you think is the motivation for companies uh, to be involved? I mean, you have uh, yeah. quite, a, um, uh, quite a strong involvement of yeah. companies uh, in, in the program uh, in, uh, in, in Austria. Yeah. And also, I'm surprised to see that you're not uh, just involving um, uh, big companies, uh, but also uh, small and uh, medium enterprises, uh, which is really a challenge uh, to me. So if you're succeeding in this, you might have a trick that you want to share. Is it on? Is it on? Yes. Okay. Um, so our task is to address the companies, yeah? And we can see that, um, that um, one of the, the topic is why the companies are joining in because they, they are losing staff and they don't find qualified staff. Mm -hmm. So this is one of the reasons. And of course, like many other countries, we have an aging population and we have a high percentage of people between 50 and 60 now in the work process. And companies in former times did not learn how to deal with the subjects or topics of these age groups. And now they have support. Um, and we can see that the bigger companies uh, before also return to work or fit to work programs already had some uh, yeah, opportunities to support the, to the, the employees. Um, the small and medium sized companies, they were all, you know, they, they, really need, they really need the support from outside yeah, to, to get it started. And then we can see there, as, as my, Mrs. Albin yesterday said, we have to differ between the branches or the sectors because you can see the higher qualified, of course, the easier it is to address the company and the more willingness is there to support the employees. And if you're uh, in low paid and less qualified branches, then maybe it's easier to get other staff, yeah? unqualified staff, so they are not so willing to join in uh, a fit-to-work program. So it's really the big, big drift differences between the branches. Yeah? Um, we can see a high access in, um, in the social and the health sector, also in small uh, companies joining in there, um, like uh, you know, mobile nurses, small companies supplying the support. We can see a big access also now in tourism sector, interestingly. 
Um, but for example, if you look in the cleaning sector, you have very little companies or very few, very few companies joining in. Yeah? So there are big differences. Yeah? And do you think the difference uh, is due to the kind of work uh, that the yes, people do? Yeah. about the qualification okay. and how much the companies invested in training and education. So, and of course, they are losing a lot of knowledge if the people are uh, falling out of work process. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Maybe today you want to say something? How, why could, no? Okay, no. so I don't know if I'm even uh, speaking if you have. Is this on? Yes, it's on. Um, I'm, I don't know if I'm the right person to, to talk about this, since I, since I work within the social and sector and healthcare sector, but still, um, I believe that uh, um, uh, the employers, uh, when it comes to the private sector, they are much, much better, better on this in, than the public sector, uh, due to, uh, it's, 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 uh, they're losing money if, if, if they are, have a lot of people on sick leave and so on. They need to get people back into work. And uh, also, uh, as in many other countries, there's a huge debate at the moment and this uh, Agenda 2030 in social sustainability and the private sector are in lead, are leading that discussion and they are uh, pushing the whole uh, thing forward, I think. So, so I think they're doing a much better work than um, the public sector, unfortunately, since mm. I'm from well, the public I'm, sector. I'm impressed by this. Um uh, your, your perspective, your, your answer. I mean, this must uh, happen in uh, in Sweden uh, yeah. because uh, I mean, normally private companies. Uh, there are there are countries where if you lose uh, people. Uh, I mean, for for every person that you lose, there might be five people queuing to be uh, employed. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, and for a company, is a challenge to enter mm -hmm. uh, a program. Uh, you know, companies should. Uh, think uh, in, in terms of uh, human rights, uh, but they often uh, think in terms, I mean, they, but they also have to make profit. Uh, mm. And so the, the, the balance is, uh, is not always uh, so straightforward. Uh, if I can yep, just say sure. one, one more thing, that in, in, in Sweden, uh, uh, during, uh, back in the days, um, for every, every person there was five others knocking on the door, wanted to get that job. Yeah. It's not that anymore. Not in every sector. In some sectors, yes. But uh, we also face the aging po uh, population and uh, high, high employment rates. So it's getting a bit difficult to find employers. Uh, so, so people to do the job. So, yeah, yeah. and then of course I would add it's uh, one thing is uh, to have to train uh, a new person, and you know it's it's uh, also an investment. Uh, but but still, uh, uh, in in several EU countries uh, that is the case. So let, let's hear from Viking his perspective on this. Thank you. The problem with the question it doesn't really fit into what we have in Finland. First of all, we have a law that gives the employer, in a way, the right and the duty to follow up when somebody is on a sick leave for more than 30 days mm -hmm. to check what is the situation, what are your plans, are you going to get well coming back. We have a several step, next step at 60 days, and if it goes up to 90 days, then we start looking at, okay, what is the plan for rehabilitation and so on and so forth. So uh, there is, doesn't need to be a measure at the place of the workplace. And uh, the second uh, thing that we are working with is this um, uh, people with uh, partial uh, workability. Instead of uh, collecting enterprises, we are training um, coordinators for people with uh, partial workability that are able to look at the whole variety of things that are needed uh, to get a person back, to see what social security is necessary, so on and so forth. So uh, we are looking at it from a different point of view, and mm -hmm. uh, we are not talking about uh, enterprises that has a measure. And if I may comment on, on, on your uh, comment in a while, that the enterprises should look at uh, human rights. Uh, it's a bit difficult to explain to a small company with uh, five persons working there trying to make a survival 
I'm not surprised at all that they don't know the information. As uh, somebody said, that uh, there's a lot of wrong information. Uh, there is so much raw data out on internet that to actually find what a company needs, uh, it's difficult. And that mm -hmm. is the reason why we are trying to train these uh, uh, coordinators who know all the in information and can advise uh, a company, both big and small. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I mean, we got some interesting perspectives. And the, the people from the companies uh, want to add anything, want to comment on this? Yeah, there is somebody there. Just one second, it's not uh, working. <coughs> I think one of the things that has to be borne in mind is this is that the social insurance model is a member state competency and therefore as pointed out by the last speaker the social insurance policy and practice in Finland is very different uh, to many other countries so we see a big divergence those and that has a factor but one of the factors that we're seeing in Ireland is that as the employment level the unemployment level goes down. Shall we say the value that employers attach to their employees tends to increase because the cost of losing and re recruiting a replacement with all the associated training, supervisory and associated costs can be significant. But there's a very fundamental point which goes to the heart of the social insurance model and that is the policy adopted by the insurance industry in a number of member states. Their policy and practice is generally to have a total hands-off and host, almost hostile or adversarial approach when an injury or an illness happens. So that um, acts against constructive engagement by the employer <coughs> with the employee in providing support on a phased return to work or on partial return or return to slightly different duty while they're phased back into their... So I think in terms of the EU model, I think the insurance industry really needs to be brought into this and to be encouraged to become a partner, not an adversary, in the return to work concept. Personally, thanks for the comment. I don't know if the, the companies, the people from the companies want to comment on, on this? No? Okay. So maybe we can move on to the next uh, question. For the poll, get your phone at hand. So what is uh, the economic loss to society due to cancer-related uh, loss of productivity and working days? 4.5 billion euros, 9.5 billion euros, or 14.5 billion euros? Ah, this is for the EU, sorry. Mm. <laughs> uh -huh. So... <coughs> You are a bit uh, more pessimistic uh, this time than the reality. So the current cost uh, of uh, lost uh, productivity and working days is 9.5 billion euros in the European Union per year. So it's, uh, it's quite a huge uh, uh, economic uh, loss. Yeah, <laughs> of course, uh, Viking has uh, a comment here. In view of the experience that we have in Finland, this is a very optimistic uh, view for only 14.5 billion euros for the whole of Europe for cancer-related diseases. It's, uh, I was almost about to say, unbelievable. It's too low. Yeah. 
Yeah, this is this is an estimation uh, that uh, we got from the Aranson et al. Uh, report in 2013. Yeah. Okay, so we may move to the next uh, question. Aha, uh -huh, there is a question. So how transferable is the methodology Finland used to other states? The calculation, method. The calculation? yeah, the calculation. Okay. Yep, sure. It's a specific direct question. Um, we have used the total wage sum uh, in Finland to do the calculations. So the, quest, the methodology as such is transferable to all other countries. But the problem is that uh, is the statistics in the country good enough? Uh, we have fairly good statistics in the Finland, uh, but the methodology as such is transferable. And actually we are working with uh, the EU OSHA to see how we can uh, come up with a simple, usable uh, method uh, methodology to calculate the cost for the European Union countries. I think we were talking about using four or five other countries as examples. Uh, there are also, of course, other methodologies that can be used to calculate it. Uh, but of course, ours is the best <laughs> that goes without <laughs> saying. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, it is not very difficult, but you need to have reliable uh, statistics. So we are happy to share this methodology with anybody who is interested. And as, uh, we are working also with the EU OSHA to, to do it on a European basis. And hopefully, if I may do a bit of advertisement, we are trying together with the ILO to set up a global OSH coalition where we are setting up international task groups to deal with different issues and one of them will definitely be dealing with uh, with data evidence and indicators and then the cost will be included in that thank you I also have a question. Uh, those data can be disarticulated uh, for different uh, we are working on looking at um, this, uh, this cost, who will pay it, how much goes for the society, how much for the victims, how much for workers, how, uh, f sorry, for uh, uh, employers, how much for enterprises. Um, there it is a bit more difficult and it requires a bit more work on that. Uh, we are also looking at uh, can we take an individual disease and try to mm -hmm. calculate the cost of that. Uh, it is possible, but uh, we are still talking about estimates. And uh, then what we would like to do is not only to do it in our ministry, but also bring in the social partners so that we have a sort of consensus on, on the situation. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we can move to the next poll. So, what percentage of the working population in the European member states report suffering from a chronic illness? 23%, 33%, and 43%. This is chronic conditions among the working age population. This is a tricky question because there are, I mean, there are other data normally showing the number of people with a chronic condition among the general population, which is 33%. But the, uh, the people with a chronic condition among the working age population are 23%. So the right answer is 23% which is still incredibly high. So it's, I mean, we cannot uh, uh, avoid considering uh, the impact that chronic conditions have uh, on work. 
we, we are mainly talking now on uh, how chronic conditions impact work. But uh, do you have information or any evidence on, uh, on the opposite, how work can impact on chronic conditions? Yeah, Irene, do you want to comment? Because it's true the, the opposite as well. Good work can have a positive impact on, uh, on people with chronic conditions. We can see only in the... Is it it's turned on? Yes, okay. Yeah. Um, maybe it's not, it's just the evidence from the companies we have in our programs. And we have a lot, of course, a lot of people there with chronic diseases reintegrated in the workplace. What we can see, but the work supports them for to stabilize their whole conditions, life conditions. Yeah? So, um, and it's a plan where you have in the first month um, steps you're taking, but you also always can have the, the advice or the coach uh, in between. And we can really see that works is, um, is a kind of healing or stabilizing factor for people, for, uh, especially for people with um, psychiatric pro problems, for example. Yeah? So, um, you have to find the right moment when you address them and how you address them and then the right, make the right plan. But it really helps them actually to stabilize their life. So that's our experience on the cases we have in the companies. Yeah, thank you. I could also comment on that. Not from a data evidence base. Uh, of course, uh, we know that uh, health is, uh, work is good for health, um, and we have data on that. But uh, what we try to do in Norway when um, enabling work for youth and other vulnerable groups is that we try to get a closer cooperation with the health uh, sector because uh, it is kind of a challenge. Uh, to uh, improve the awareness uh, in the health sector that um, uh, work is good for health and uh, that it should be possible to combine uh, having a chronic disease with the participation in the workplace. And we also try to raise awareness uh, <coughs> among the workers in the public employment sector uh, to do, do this. It, it, I, I think we are improving, but uh, I think it's still a long way to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, Trude, while you have the, the mic, speaking, uh, do you mind if uh, we go on with Trude just uh, for a minute? Uh, we have a question uh, specific uh, for you. So it's, uh, does your program cover both the physical and mental health disabilities? If so, is helping youth uh, with mental health issues more challenging? Yes, uh, the answer is, uh, I guess, yes to both questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, we are covering all aspects of uh, health problems, both mental and physical uh, disabilities and health problems. Um, uh, the da data from Norway shows that uh, it's more challenging uh, to get uh, youth or other vulnerable groups with mental health problems. Uh, into work, work and to stay in work. And uh, it's also um, those who are overrepresented uh, among uh, uh, disabled and other um, benefits as well. But uh, this is also a priority task which is quite challenging. Yeah. I don't Thank you. Viking, you wanted to make a comment? So, question. Well, yeah. We have been looking uh, on the other side uh, on the impact of work on uh, chronic, chronic diseases or shall we say general illnesses. And uh, of course we have to keep in mind that when you talk about uh, occupational disease, it is just an administrative decision. And the problem is then how can we divide, uh, let's say a disease like asthma to which part is it related to work. And uh, the Finnish Institute has done some studies on that, and uh, we can see that, uh, let's say, something between 4 and 12% of these normal illnesses are also related to the work. But the problem there is to decide this uh, administrative decision. Is it an occupational disease 
will it com be compensated? Can we involve rehabilitation and all those things? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. But there is also another component uh, to uh, bear in mind uh, uh, when addressing work in chronic conditions uh, is that uh, people uh, off work normally tend to develop uh, an additional chronic conditions to the one that they have. So, and and that, is, uh, that normally goes hand in hand with uh, mental conditions. Uh, like uh, people, uh, let's say, with a, a normal uh, condition like asthma, when off work for too long, then they tend to develop uh, also uh, depression, for instance, or, uh, or other uh, uh, mental conditions. So it is really important to, to find ways to maintain people at work, also to avoid the, uh, the, the addition of other conditions. So maybe we can move on to the next poll. So what percentage of the working age population in OECD countries rely on this Six percent, two percent, and four percent. Uh huh. So you know this one. <laughs> ah. The working. So what percentage of the working age population in OECD countries rely on disability benefits? So a few more to, to vote. Well, the right answer is 6%. So you answered the uh, Almost, oh, okay, now it's fixing. <laughs> so there are some uh, <laughs> tricky ones. Okay. So this is the last poll. I wonder if there are other questions. Uh, yeah? So we can look at the, uh, some other questions. <coughs> So somebody wants to ask a question. Yeah, there is somebody. Yeah, let's um, let's get the question from. Thank you. My name is it working? Yeah. My name is Jan Grimeuse. Um My question would be to the panel. So any volunteers to answer it? Um, Many of the national approaches, cost-benefit approach and all the reintegration approaches, um, imply a sort of rational behavior of employers. That they are rational human beings, taking all the pros and the cons and the costs and the benefits. Um, but I have my doubts there. <laughs> I think in, uh, someone mentioned already in in the turmoil of being an entrepreneur, you have to take all sorts of decisions, you are busy doing sales, producing, and that is really a strong emotional process, I believe. So, what is your opinion on that? Are the, the policies not too much relying on rational behavior of employers? And do they act rationally? to start. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I will then thinking high together with you. Is it on? Now okay. it's on. Yeah. 
Uh, if um, employees are rational, um, I think it's like with the rest of us. Sometimes we are rational and sometimes we are not. Uh, um, but mainly, I choose to believe in the good in human being, all kinds. And uh, I think that uh, if you, as I said in my presentation, that if you have a good dialogue with uh, all the partners, uh, I think, uh, and, the, and if you are good at listening to each other, to make sure that you have a common understanding of what is the challenges and what is the needs for both the employee who wants to take in a young person or another, or to uh, hold on to a person who is working in the firm. I think if you listen, if you talk to each other, if uh, the pu public authority facilitate the necessary support, yes, then I think it's a win-win situation for all parties, and then I think it is possible. That's why I work in this field. I think it is possible. Thank you. I want, I want to answer your question maybe in a strange way. I would say that the representatives we are talking of uh, within the small and medium-sized companies, especially in the small companies, are more emotionally addressed because they have a high bondage to their employees. They are kind of family members sometimes. Of course, we have a bias of companies because we have companies joining in who want to do something. And this is a small percentage of the, big, of the, of the companies we have in Austria. But and the bigger the companies, the more the rational arguments are calculated or taken in, in account. Yeah. So. Good answers. Um, I think also uh, uh, one experience in Sweden is that um, a lot of employers uh, need more knowledge and uh, support and how to handle different situations and process and, and, and uh, uh, and also sometimes pure knowledge, and therefore we try to, on a regional level, from a, from a national level, uh, mostly from a re re regional level, uh, to, to um, give guidance uh, persons from the uh, social insurance companies and employment support, uh, give support to the employers, because it's, uh, I think it's a good question. Really, um, uh, even though it's a bit, you know, rational, not rational, but yeah, uh, there can be problems, definitely. So, Viking. Jan Mihil, I think you agree with us all that employers are rational. Uh, but the question is, what is their rationality? Is it aimed at taking uh, people who are partially employable to work? Or is their aim to survive with the people that they are working with to continue the process? I think the comment from Austria, I think it was, that once you have a group of people, you want to take care of them. But to bring in other people is already another question. And here the problem is, is not that there is not information, but how can a small employer find the information that we want her or him to receive, because they have a lot of other things that they have to be rational about. The, the problem or the, the um, 